Uh, We've tried the reverse. That didn't work. This is, <laughs> this is the OGM community call for Thursday, August 18th, 2022. Sorry, Ken, go ahead. That's right. I was going to say, I have, a, I have, this, I have a, a, a beef with people who say nature is better off without <laughs> humans. Humans are nature. Humans are, are an evolutionary part of it. And if we take ourselves out of the picture, the planet will grieve in its own way. And then in a couple hundred million years, there'll be something else. But we're here to be an expression of natural intelligence, not to take ourselves and call ourselves a cancer just because certain people are acting that way. I love that. Thank you. And, and fucking a. I'm feisty today. <laughs> Go, Ken. Go, Ken. Maybe you check in first. How about that? Uh, um, but you're, you're, um, I'm trying to remember what call it was just in the last week where I basically uh, put up the idea that wilderness areas where no humans are allowed to go except as tourists are stupid. That humans who know what they're doing are good for the good for the earth, good for the forest, good for whatever. Yep. Um, and and that oh I remember it was a uh, Jamie Cassio did not like that. Uh, Jamie was like no 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 wait a minute. And we had a very interesting conversation from there. But I I, I caused his his uh, throat to tighten at some point uh, on that. Yeah, it's um in in reading um oh what was it is um Kevin Jones you know posted this thing about um uh, Ansel Adams had kicked the indigenous people out of Yosemite and yeah. and I'm like mm, I, I've heard that but is it true and turns out they were they were thrown out of Yosemite Valley in 1850 by uh, somebody named John Savage I think. And huh. so that was long, long before. And they never came back. That was long, long before um, Adams came along. And in that, they said one of the myths that Adams really was, um, uh, that he propagated was very destructive, was the idea of untouched nature. But in fact, humans have been around for millions of years. We have touched every part of nature. There's no part of this planet that's, that was not touched massaged, worked over, you know, and just because it didn't happen in ways that Europeans recognized it, like when they got here, they didn't recognize farming because it wasn't in straight rows. They just saw, you know, these forests of, of chestnuts and acorns and stuff. So oh, it's all nature. It's like, no, this is very definitely human intervention. So I think setting aside certain parts of the land for the recovery of ecosystems and animals is a great idea, but it's going to require... I would I would posit that putting indigenous people on the land who know how to live on that land and work with it would make it far more uh, beneficial than if you simply left the land to itself. And then I read that article on Pleistocene Park and what um, mammoths used to do because they would knock trees over and they would create this, you know, savannas and grasslands. And, you know, we really have such a small understanding of how nature actually works. Um, and it all comes from inside of our, well, we're the most superior intelligence on the planet, so therefore we must know what's going on. And it's just, it's it's pathetic the way that we um, we project our, our superiority onto everything and think, well, you know, we're we're the height of evolution. I don't think so. We're just we're the so latest, you know, example. What makes us so arrogant? Why do we do that so reliably? Testosterone. <laughs> is it, so is it TIMR? <laughs> TMIR, TMIR. So TIMR. Uh, sorry, and it, this is a, now a politically correct term. This is a grade school joke, but testosterone induced mental retardation. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, th I think so. Which I think is like uh, you know part of what broke the planet. I mean, uh, there, there's a lot of that. I think uh, I think out there. Uh, Somewhere in my reading, it might have been Pinker. He talked about periodically throughout our, our history. Um, there have been times when homicidal maniacs are ruling and the women have said, you know what, you can't keep this shit up. You guys got to take this out of here. And I think we're kind of at that point again. So in, in Iceland, there's a nice story about the global financial crisis and basically how uh, fishermen turned into mortgage brokers and, uh, you know, uh, subprime investors overnight and were suddenly really, really wealthy. And then shit hits fan, all the money goes away and all the women turn to them and go, you assholes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and basically a lot of different things happen, including a constitutional rewrite that I think was done by men and women, but that that never got ratified by Congress. So they don't get the new constitution. It's still sort of sitting there. But but there's some cultures where they've sort of seen this at work and taken measures to, to kind of stop it. Um, 
Let me just hold on that for a second if anybody else wants to chime in. Otherwise, I'd love to go back to you, Ken, for check-in because that was likely not what you were thinking maybe of checking in at the beginning. So anybody else with a, a thing they want to add to this? There being no comments, uh, back to you in the booth. Okay, um, good morning. Uh, nice to see people. Um, I don't have a lot to report. I'm still still sitting on my patio with plantar fasciitis. It's just takes, you know, it's, it's a lesson in patience and I'm really sick of lessons in patience. I'm fucking fed up with them. No, um, <laughs> I feel like I've had so many lessons in patience in my life and it's like, do, really, do I really need another one here? But, um, you know, if I get out of bed in the middle of the night, I'm reminded that, yeah, this is definitely still, still there. I have these really spongy shoes I wear during the day that prevent me from feeling a lot of pain. But uh, if I don't, if I walk barefoot, it's really painful. <clears throat> so I'm doing what I can to maintain a, an even keel, uh, trying to keep myself entertained and um, engaged. Um, but this is two months now and it might be several more months and the summer is going away and it's just been really hard. Um, so I, I find that I'm having to draw on my gratitude practice a lot more uh, than I normally do in order to keep myself uh, from spiraling down into, into uh, whatever it is I spiral down into. Um, so that's why I'm a little bit feisty. Um, and, uh, you know, just observing the world through Zoom connecting with people and reading the news and reading some interesting books. Uh, I just started a book on systems inspired leadership. Um, just completed Damon Santola's book on change, which I, I can't recommend enough. And um, yesterday I was on Gill's Between the Worlds call. This might be of interest to people who are on this call. And I convinced him to let me run a cafe because, you know, every month it's Gill talking to people one one to one so we did three rounds and people were like oh my god this was the best call please do this again so um <laughs> if you ever want to do that jerry i'd be happy to help you design something like that and we could give it a try so people have a chance to work in small groups and get to know each other on a little deeper level Stuart was there he came in towards the end but he he um he maybe can say something about that so that's me i hope everybody else as well um and i'll just shut up and listen Mm, thanks, Ken. Really appreciate that. Um, hope your foot heals up quickly. Uh, Stuart, did you want to add anything to that from what you saw? No, I was only there for uh, one third, one round, but I'm really familiar with uh, Cafe. As a matter of fact, I had um, dinner with um, with David Isaacs in, uh, in Asheville uh, a couple of months ago. Oh, wow. Uh, or last month or something like that. And it was just wonderful. But anyway, you know, Ken brought a certain, um, uh, uh, a real humanity and a softerness to the, to the, to the uh, uh, gathering. And, and um, it's amazing when you ask a, a few personal questions, how deep the dive goes and how quickly and how much people appreciated that. So it was a lovely um, surprise experience. Cause as I said, I showed up late. It was just, it was just really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so I will you. add, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. And, and thanks for that, Stuart, that helps a lot. And I will add from our last uh, OGM call that I've been pondering a lot, sort of the, the, the dynamics, the diversity, things of that nature. And one of the words you said right now, Stuart, softer really calls out to me, uh, which is lovely. So I, I would like to invite other process methods into what we do here. Uh, let's figure out how to do it. Ken, maybe we, we conspire to do a cafe format OGM check-in or something, um, and but other but also other people, other things. I'm I'm like completely open to to doing that, and realize that what we normally sort of the the assumed method of operation for these calls is people sharing ideas, many of which are outside of their personal experience in the world, and hustling to add links and share stuff. And I'm completely guilty of that in a way that's like a, a race to have an answer and that that's not conducive to everybody and not necessarily a soft and welcoming uh, kind of environment. So uh, so let's let's change it up. Let's re-architect some parts of this and uh, and go do that. Um, Eric is asking me to, to describe Render, which I'd love to do actually. I'd love to check in real quick <clears throat> because I'm in New York this afternoon. I fly home to Portland. I arrived here Sunday, uh, had to get from Newark airport into the city and felt like a complete newbie. <laughs> and then and then I'm like, ah, this Newark airport terminal, I'd forgotten how bad it is, how ugly. And wow, can't they put a sign up that tells you what the train is? And hey, welcome back to New York. 
um, <laughs> when I when I was planning the trip, it looked like it was there were going to be thunderstorms two days this week. It has been as beautiful as I've ever seen it in New York. Like I've been here four days and, and like just perfect, beautiful weather. You want to sit outside, you want to talk. It's very beguiling and it's very dangerous to be in New York when it's so pretty because you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. I could be here again. And I lived here from 92 to 98 when I worked for Esther. <clears throat> um, and I got to interview Esther as the last session of the render event on Tuesday. They're going to be posting all the sessions of, of the render event on YouTube. It's just not produced yet. So uh, it'll probably take a moment. I don't know if the Vimeo stream, which was live, actually turned into a, a stored recording right away. I actually haven't checked. And we're, we also talked yesterday in a debrief uh, session about um, slightly less bad than JFK. Thanks, Chris. Um, we also talked a little bit about call outs, basically short clips <clears throat> that we would hope would go viral uh, to take <clears throat> from different parts of, of the of the sessions yesterday during the day. <clears throat> so apparently the Vimeo is available. Uh, so Eric, thank you. I didn't realize that. I will I will go um, click on that and add it to my brain. And uh, that's fantastic. There it is, six hours and two minutes worth. Thank you. That was that was so easy. Um, and and so it was fun. It was like a really fun afternoon. The whole thing started at eleven thirty New York time and ended around seven with sort of uh, some beer and wine. Uh, lots. Of it, we attracted mostly white men. Uh, not a lot of uh, diversity in the crowd, but a tremendously interesting sort of mix of people showing up who cared about this in lots of different ways. Uh, met a guy from Princeton who teaches creativity, met some lots of startup -y people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The reason that Betaworks, which is a venture capital firm here in uh, New York, and I'm sitting in the Betaworks offices, a little booth, a little video booth right now. The reason they ran this at all is that they're interested in uh, running a camp around tools for thinking that's going to happen just in a couple of weeks. Uh, so they would like to have startups apply to be in the camp. They'll get a small investment from Betaworks and looks like some co-investors as well, because John Borthwick, the, the founder of Betaworks, has been uh, talking to other funds to co-invest and, and sort of help build the sector. Uh, my major interest, I'm interested less in tools for thinking for individuals to create lovely but private bags of, of, of insights and, and woven knowledge and more in the creation of a commons of what we know and why we believe what we believe and all that kind of stuff. So I've got I've got kind of a an ulterior motive, which is how do we how do we foster the sharing of all this uh, all this thinking into the commons in a way that leads toward better debate, better discussion, etc. Um, we had a, a bunch of different sessions yesterday. One of the, there was one point at which uh, there were some five demos in a row. Was one of the sessions. I was one of the demos using my brain. My brain got a lot of airtime at the session. Uh, not because I was trying to proselytize the brain, I hope that message got through, but because I really wanted people to get a sense of what it's like for a person to do intense note taking in real time with a, a particular power tool for uh, thinking. Um, and I think that kind of made it across. But one of the other demos was Linus Lee, um, who is kind of doesn't have an offer, isn't trying to build a startup, is just jinking around on his own in cool ways and is really smart on this. And he had basically created something using GPT-3, uh, the, the transformer tool that uses large language models as a back end server, uh, where he could feed it a paragraph out of something. He would just drop the paragraph into a, a rectangle that had two axes on it, let's say faster, slower, or angrier, uh, kinder. And then he could drag that, that he would drag a dot around in the space. And as he dragged the dot around in real time, the sentence would transform and be reworded. So if he went to slower, the sentence would become like, every couple of years we meet to talk about tools for thinking. And if he went over to the left, you're like, every five minutes we meet for tools for thinking or something like that. And, and it was, just, everybody sort of gasped. It was, a, it was a lovely demo of things we don't expect things we don't think are happening that are now possible. And then when asked if he could just give people sort of access to the beta, he said, actually, no, uh, my computer was pegged like in the red in the red zone and my server uh, allocation was completely gone doing that in real time. There's no way like three people could do it at the same time. It was just an experiment, but it was really cool. Um, and then uh, the founders of Readwise were here. Uh, Alice Albrecht from Recollect was here uh, doing AI kind of stuff. Uh, in also in text and text generation, and then also assembling text collections for writers, basically helping writers uh, pick through and, and assemble and stream together 
a blog post, a book, an essay, or whatever else. Um, so, I, and, and Eric, I'd kind of like to see what you liked and anyone else who who listened into the live stream or whatever. I'd love other, well, while we're on the, uh, the event, I'd love other feedback on it as well. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I was impressed by Gordon's talk because he's thinking about the um, fundamental data layer and how you're going to interact between these tools. So he's looking at IFPS and I'm looking at Hypercore. And I'm wondering, okay, is there a synergy between these people and the D web camp? Could that be brought together somehow? And how? Um, you know? Very likely, yes. I mean, there's lots of people, including Gordon, who are thinking really deeply about how do we distribute data and then bring it back together again when we need it in the right way with some permissioning, right? Um, and he's busy trying to hack IF, IPFS, the interplanetary file system, mm -hmm. and other sorts of things to do that. Um, and I'm not attending the DWeb meetup, which sounds like it's going to be, it hasn't happened yet, right? But it's next Yeah, week. Mark will be there. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be super cool. Mm -hmm. uh, wish I could be. Um, anybody else have a thought on that crossing? I don't think so. Um, but thanks for bringing that up, Eric. Hi. Pete. Um, did D-Web uh, has had monthly meetups, um, and, and they're deep in all that kind of stuff. So And they're really good. They're totally fun. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, let's put a link to D-Web meetups. And Wendy Hanamura, who runs them, is awesome. I think this is the link to the D-Web meetup. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, you can go join there and then you'll get notices for the meetings and invited and it's a really smart crowd. Um, any other thoughts on the render session? Otherwise, I'll go back to check in round. Cool. Um, well, how about we go um, Grace, Julian, uh, Bill, and on from there. Um. Really me. I'm getting I'm getting some echo from where you are somehow, Grace. Oh, I didn't turn on my. Yeah, I think you're not connected to the mic directly. Sometimes. All right, how's that? Much better. All right, cool. I actually have the mic. Yay! Uh, Thank you. <laughs> you turn on the mic. Good idea. Um, yeah, it's been a really confronting week for me. I, I'm i looking at raising money, and the number that I've said is $55 million through a DAO, and that's the number that they raised for Assange DAO. And I'm trying to rejigger the entire economy, so I'm like, well, that seems like, you know, enough money to free Assange. That seems like a drop in the bucket for what I'm trying to do. That seems like a good number. And it's so crazy, right? Like, I am really clear that I have no clue what I'm doing. I've written something like 120 yeah, yeah. white papers for crypto projects. And that's not including like the two or 300 organizations that I spoke to and either they didn't hire me or I didn't hire them or they asked me for free consulting or whatever. And I've watched really great projects that were very sensible, completely fail to raise any money. And I've seen absolutely ridiculous projects that made no sense and had no previous expertise raise millions of dollars. And I have no idea how it works. And I talk to people at the point and all I've been doing, all I've been doing is just talking to people and saying, look, this is what I'm up to. I'm raising money. What should I do? What do I do? Who do I talk to? And um, I just have this sense it's going to work and I have this sense it really better work because I honestly don't, I've been so inspired by what I'm working on and I'm writing a white paper for it. I've been writing blog, blog posts a couple times a week and I've been working with my two co-founders in Kenya and the Philippines when they're not threatened by violence because of elections or earthquakes or typhoons or all, like having founders from the developing world, it's enlightening. It's enlightening and it's the only way that I feel comfortable doing what I'm doing. And they're actually people that I want to be working with. They're just the coolest people. And that's why I chose them. And 
but I'm, I'm, I just feel like I have to succeed this time because I don't think I can write more white papers for shit coins for the rest of my life. Or I've been writing white papers and blog posts for like the security industry, like API security and cloud security. And I just like, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep, I was just so confronted by what I do for a living this week. Like I, I, I'm a really good tech writer. I write for the biggest companies in the world for storage and cloud and whatever. And um, if anybody's read The Big Leap the, uh, by um, Gay Hendrick, he talks about your area of excellence and then like your area of genius and how your area of excellence is always pulling you back because you can make a lot of money at it and people are always calling you to do it. But your area of genius is this leap and I'm right there. And I just had such a, like, today I just had just, like, an emotional moment. Like, what the fuck am I writing? This crappy marketing pollution that's just, like, one security company competing with the other one. And who the hell cares which application security protocol? It doesn't freaking matter. They're all the same, man. And I write for both. I write for all the competitors. Like, <laughs> So I'm the copywriter who's like, I'm writing this one and now I'm just like, and I tell them I'm writing for the competitor and they're like, yeah, but you're the expert. I'm like, okay, great. It's like, it's so fucking absurd. I just have to raise at least enough money that I can stop doing this crap work that I'm excellent at. So yeah, that's where I am. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. So, so how can we crowdsource among ourselves, uh, giving you a, 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 another stage rocket to boost you into that orbit? Like, can we set up just a pop-up call to listen to where you are and what you're trying to get done to figure out whoever wants to show up shows up, but it, you know, um, it'd be nice to help you solve that puzzle somehow and offer you some feedback, uh, in some ways and some connections or something else, right? Whatever. Uh, just to, to help you to help you pop into the next orbit. Yes, I accept that offer of help, and I will set that up. And um, probably, I guess this time, maybe on a different day of the week. Does that work um, for people? Yeah. We can pick a time for next week and uh, figure out something that works well for yeah. more people. So cool. Okay. I mean, this time works for me. I, we could do it maybe Tuesday or something. Yeah, um, exactly. Cool. That'd be great. And and I think one of the things that is just obvious in my industry is all about the hype. So the more people that can kind of hype this at the moment I want to hype this, which is going to be September 22nd, we're going to be announcing live in Nairobi and London at conferences. So like the more hype, the better. And we have some ideas about that. And yeah, and anything else you guys can contribute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. How is um, uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, so the same start time on Wednesday, the 24th of August? This start time. Does, does that work for you? No. I have something. An uh, hour later? later would work for me. And one hour okay. later would work. Sounds perfect. So 9 a.m. Pacific on Wednesday, the 24th, just picking it by fiat. Um, I, will send, I will put a note out on uh, OGM Town Square and uh, figure the rest out as we go. But if, and if there's a good reason to switch it around, we'll move it, but at least we've got a placeholder for that conversation. And I'll probably invite a couple of people from my-, from my Please, well. Any, anybody and from we'll your, a, yeah. your posse, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Booth's been great. <clears throat> Thanks, guys. <laughs> this, is, this is like uh, for all mankind, but for grace. No, never mind, bad analogy. Um, Okay, let's go back. For those who don't know, um, Rahmani means merciful. So like my whole main thing is like, it's going. Oh, I like that. Thank you. The merciful. Um, let's go to Julian Bill Gill. Uh, so my brief check, and I spent last week at the computer graphics conference in Vancouver. Uh, it's called SIGGRAPH. Uh, attendance was way down uh, because of COVID. I know many of my colleagues didn't go because of that, but they projected for it. So they actually didn't end up in the red. Uh, it's probably the biggest computer graphics conference in the world, although your graphics is a fairly significant one, much more academic. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention from what I saw there, this idea of putting power generators on top of the the, the uh, 
the, the smokestacks that flare excess natural gas. So there have been companies who put uh, devices on there to um, come to capture the energy and use it for something. So in graphics, does everybody know what a, anybody know what a render farm is? So, okay. So, so with this one company now is using them right now, they're starting to power render farms using this excess glass gas flaring, and they plan to expand uh, excess energy recovery in other areas. So I thought that was interesting that instead of going to crypto mining, it's going to 3D animation. Uh, then it came back to California, had a cat emergency for the first couple of days this week, but he's he's back to normal now, so I'm getting back to work too. Um, thank you. And, and any any highlights from the conference? And it was SIGGRAPH, right? Yeah, that was SIGGRAPH. Uh, not really. So the exhibition, the one trend I noticed was, uh, I guess you'd call it training and education. It's like all of these software packages have gotten pretty complex to use. So you do need real training in, in order to, to learn how to use them. And that was the main emphasis in the equipment exposition. Uh, I don't attend the academic part of the conference be, for two reasons. One, it's pretty damn expensive. And second, mm -hmm. it's, I'm such an old timer in the field. I can just call up my colleagues and ask them, what did your student just publish? Uh, so it was more a matter of networking. And that's, you know, the networking has been cut out for three years now. Yeah. So of the people who were there was a chance to connect up with them again. So you're reminding me of a conference that I went to a very long time ago. I think it was called BBS Con or something like that. And it was a, an annual bulletin board systems conference where Mustang Software and PicoSpan and and all the, the old Fido net was, I think, there. But all the old BBS uh, vendors were there. And, and it was early internet days. Might have been, I think it was early web days already. So the web was around. And I'm going from person to person going, okay, okay, y'all could build like the distributed internet and blah, blah, blah. And they were all, they were all fighting their old battles and not, I couldn't find anybody who was busy thinking out of, thinking their way out of the BBS space and into this future that we've sort of got now that looks more like Vanity Fair magazine than organic stuff that was going on. Uh, it was it was really pretty amazing to me. They were they were not doing that. I had a similar experience at computer supported collaborative work, whatever whatever that I went to, where it was like the people who gave the speeches had given almost the same speech like eight years earlier, and they had like sinecures in the social network that was that conference, and they weren't thinking hard about what this medium made possible, how it changed everything, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's funny, people do not grasp change uh, and leap into it very readily. Yeah, SIGGRAPH yeah. <clears throat> would get you re-energized because there are people are constantly thinking of in opposite directions as to what you just described. For example, if you try and design something in 3D software and it depends which package you're using as to how the data for that is stored. And of course, people want to be able to transfer their data to other packages so they can do other things. And there's, unlike the CAD industry, where the big CAD vendors just really focus on customer lock in, they don't let, like their customers to do things like that. In the 3D world, there's much, much less of that. So you see scene, uh, scene description formats popping up, which is what this concept is called, like the one from Pixar called USD or GLTF from the Chronos Foundation. And you're able to transfer your data between different packages fairly effortlessly. Um, then also people do at SIGGRAPH, I find people are trying to find, figure out ways of using things that are just a little bit off that way or that way. But the thing is, when you do, you end up with lots of serendipity and finding a, a whole new discovery just by trying to tweak a few concepts. Love that. Uh, Stuart? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on what you were saying, Jerry, about people's resistance to change and just how many, 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 many folks in the world are just going along as if things will just continue to go along the way they are and they don't see <clears throat> all of the calamities that most of the folks on this call uh, actually see. That was one of the wonderful things about Ken's facilitation on Gil's call yesterday. Um, the, the, the notion that um, so many people were in the same conversation. I mean, the last breakout group was, <clears throat> what are you seeing and how are you feeling today about what's going on in the world and how are you coping with it? So mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to punctuate what you said, Jerry. 
Thank you. If, if only somebody would write a book about thriving amid constant change. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, Grace. Yeah, I just want to comment, like we have this thing that we do, like we say, people are so resistant to change. And I would just like to invite us all to look at our own lives and where we're also resistant to change, because it turns out that uh, the people want to call us people. That's all. Thank you. Um, I think I had Bill, Doug B, then Gil. Mr. Anderson. Yeah, good morning, folks. Um, all I can say is here in Texas, it's now under 100 degrees for a few days. So that was the high temperatures. But um, and we might get some rain after 56 days of nothing. Um, the only thing that really has concerns me is this. Uh, Gil posted this really little this week article, and I followed it up with this and read this very long piece by James Pogue in Vanity Fair about well the new right. But it really disturbed me in a way, but mostly has made me really think again about how we have to try and talk with each other. Um, because the people highlighted in that call, I mean, you know, they're my son's friends, friends of my nephews and nieces, and they're reading Aristotle. They're not illiterate. They're very well educated. They're having conversations, you know, in compound sentences. And it's like, whoa, these people are not, you just can't write people off. They are really thinking about things. They hold some of the same critiques that I have about the current, you know, what we've built in this neoliberal capitalist kind of like markets are the answer. There is no alternative. Like, where did that come from? So they have the same concerns. They just, and it was like, we have to be talking with these people. These are not, you know, just aggrieved. These are really, you know, well, I don't want to say as competent as the rest of us. So, um, it just really made me think this is going to be, uh, this is really what we have to try and talk about. And it's just, we just want to highlight what, what Grace mentioned. I've been trying myself to when I make a generalized kind of judgment to see how well it applies to my own behavior, which I often find is, <laughs> it often applies quite well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I'm just, I don't know really, I'm just struggling with coming to terms with that. Um, you know, regardless of what the politicians are capitalizing on in terms of, you know, the kind of arena in which they think they're operating. I mean, they are operating, but, you know, they have their own illusion about what the world is. So, I mean, that's where, that's where I'm at. Um. I guess two questions. One is, um, how ha how can you describe it just a wee bit more? How this has affected you, uh, and then the second is, I think this might make a really good subject for a call next Thursday. Uh, I would love to bring more attention to this article, this topic, the general sort of dynamics of it, and so forth. It, it makes a lot of sense. The article resonated really strongly with me as well. Okay, so what I did, I went to Jerry's brain because he posted the link. Thank you very much. And I looked at all the links to this and I decided to, oh, what's the guy's name? He is, anyway, one of the, the open letter to open-minded people, the open-minded uh -huh. progressives, which he, he wrote this long blog post in, I don't know, 2006 or eight or whatever. And so I read it <laughs> and what I recognized is stuff I don't write because when I think that way, I'm like, that isn't even worth putting on paper. That's really sloppy. Nonetheless, you know, I mean, for example, you know, he says, well, all these people on the left, you know, they make criticisms of, you know, blah, blah, this regime. Well, how about the U.S. and the way we behaved in Central America? I'm like, yeah, what's your point? You got a point after that? I already understand that. So this is where I'm thinking that's where the conversation, if it's going to go somewhere, not just like, you know, look at the kind of sloppy, incomplete thinking other people have. It's like, well, yeah, let's look at it. That's what I'd like to do. So that's one example. So I don't mean, so 
I'm a little cranky because I've been doing a lot of reading, you know, and good writing. And thinking. Good writing is, well, good writing you know, reflects good thinking, but good writing is not necessarily universal. So Ken is cranky, Grace is a little cranky, Bill is a little cranky. I'm sensing a little pattern here. All right, we may have to- I'm like not something. cranky, I'm feisty. Feisty, not cranky. My apologies, my apologies. I, I, and I, I think feisty is a funner way of being cranky. I mean, angry or something like that. Don't forget curmudgeon. Yeah, yeah, curmudgeon. But curmudgeonly can be very passive, passive aggressive or whatever. You can just like, ah. Yeah, or in my case, like, Ken Tankerous. Like, like, like Roy Kent and Ted Lasso. <laughs> uh, did, was someone else chiming in? Sorry. I, I said in my case, it's Ken Tankerous. Ken Tankerousness. Nice. You mean having, you mean having a fuck you mindset? <laughs> I like it. Um, Okay, we, we have ooh, too many links back. Uh, Doug Breitbart Gilrick. Um, so my check-in is actually um, Grace had shared, we had a sort of a sidebar a few weeks back and she had shared this idea of, I see all these people raising, you know, $50 million and in smoke and nonsense and it and it goes away and like, well, if they can do that, then what if somebody like actually with intention, integrity and, and, and ideas did it? <laughs> like, why can't I do that? And that really, really uh, struck a chord. So um, I'm working, everybody that I'm currently working for or with is in real aspirational manifesting tomorrow today spaces and all of those efforts universally bar none are the principles are all affected by um the old paradigm you know how to pay the bills how to like you know meet needs in the terms of the old paradigm right which is doing something and grace you re 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 raised it today with i do this work to make money to pay for the roof so that i can do the work i want to be doing and so um i sort of did some digging and there are 273,000 billionaires today like register that that's a really big number of people with really big obscene accumulations of wealth. And I can't help but believe that out of 273,000, there isn't somebody that, you know, would be willing to take a walk on the wild side of um, contributing their resource and their engagement and expertise in um, in contributing to a value ecosystem in, you know, 100, 500 million dollar chunks to underwrite, you know, uh, all of the people and, and, and collaborations and efforts of folks looking to do it differently. Like really differently, like not rooted in ownership, not rooted in appreciation of value is value, but actually just create co-creating and figuring out the new as value and uh, disconnecting the quid pro quo of something for something transactional working for the money that pays the bills and all of that, but really separating those things and people are generating what they're generating and, and that's value contribution to the whole. And people are defining what they need, like what they actually need. And so I, I've been living on uh, with that and stewing on that for a few weeks. And, um, and I'm feeling into a reorientation of how do I look for the billionaire? like not raising money, 
not like the the that orientation, but um, like what are my qualifications for that person? They're joining an ecosystem. Their value contribution is fiat currency, but like what, what's required of them in order for them to qualify to fulfill that role? Um, and that's sort of blossoming uh, pretty significantly. And um, so that's what I've been, you know, in and amongst all the other stuff, that's sort of what's been, what's been living for me. Thanks, Doug. Um, two things. One, importantly, can fact check the billionaire number. It's really 2,700, not 27,000 uh, billionaires. That's a big difference in zeros. Uh, in, in my brain, it says there were 26. You're, you're muted right now. Uh, in my brain, it says there were 2,600 in 2019. So it makes sense at 2,700. So thanks for that. And be aware next time you like. Appreciate, up, appreciate the, the correction. Thank you. And then, and then separately, uh, I was uh, an old friend who's also a brain user who I haven't heard from in a while, Jim Caravalla. For a while, he was with a company called the Shackleton Company that was going to mine water out of the Shackleton Crater on the moon and start the first network of space refueling stations. Because once you have mass off the earth, which is very expensive, moving around in space ain't that expensive. And whoever's got the exons out there is going to like do pretty well, maybe. He was just a little bit early, but he had the most sophisticated mesh of brain files and, and spreadsheets I've ever seen. And he had a big database of billionaires because he was pretty sure that one of these, he was, he was looking for 80 billion for like seed, seed funding. And I was like, well, okay, that's a large number. Grace, um, maybe you should ask for a larger number is what I'm thinking. But, but then Shackleton no, exists no longer. So maybe that's a bad model. Uh, but he was thinking, well, wouldn't a billionaire like to have their name on the first network of refueling stations in outer space, which was, I thought, not an unreasonable thought. Um, sorry for the long explanation of that. <clears throat> um, Klaus and Stuart. Yeah, <clears throat> come, come in, coming to, I had COVID last week, so my mind is like, uh, oh, you know, man. the fuck. <laughs> it's an interesting experience, let me tell you. But and I came across two uh, data points that sort of threw me into a curve. One was I listened to Noam Chomsky explain recently explain how humanity has ended a last call moment in history, which will determine our collective future. And then I listened to Jamie Dimon explain that people have to to a group of his key stakeholders, mostly billionaires. Uh, how frustrated he is that people can't get it through their thick skulls that we must boost oil and gas production to make it through the climate change period. So when we are looking at, at these 2,700 whatever billionaires, they live in a data world or in an information bubble, right? That is more in line with what the Jamie Dimon would think and propagate. And they have theories about how to make it through this transition period that simply diverge from what the Noam Chomsky sees and what most people who are really paying attention to this see. So, so the reason why they are funding, and, and I also, the right place, I mean, I see projects being funded that are just not in line with, with where most people think we need to get going. Uh, it can initiate changes that are behavioral modifications that change uh, the way that uh, the American dream is structured. Um, and so I have a feeling that the, the problem is not, um, is not so much the, the, the billionaire class per se um, uh, not wanting to help. It's just that the idea of helping uh, is based on on ideas that are not in line with where we think we need to go now. Thank you, thank you, Stuart. Yeah, uh, Doug. One of the things I thought of um, as you were speaking was uh, there have been some letters sent to the U.S. Congress by by wealthy, high income people. Um, Please tax us more please tax us more. And my, my sense is that that demographic uh, might be a, a, a place to look to. 
Mm -hmm. Warren uh, Buffett, Nick, I know, Nick, is one. I know Nick, Ken, was, was Nick one. Kenauer is really good on that. He says if we don't get taxed more, the pitchforks are coming. Um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, we have in the queue Gil, Rick, Doug, Carmichael. <clears throat> yeah, and there's an article just out about how Bill Gates, the climate hawk, lobbied on the climate bill. So it's complex out there. Um, <clears throat> um, a word in support of Jamie Dimon. Um, I haven't read his or I haven't read his actual language, but I think one of the things he's saying is that we don't get to shut off fossil fuel tomorrow. We have to invest in new infrastructure for renewables, et cetera. And it's going to take fossil fuels. Maybe that's what he's saying. Um, but on the other hand, where's my other hand going on that? Um, the other hand is that you know the the, the business reality for these folks is that uh, it, you know recognizing that fossil fuel industry is going to go away at some point, they still want to extract all possible value from it on the way down. So there's no rush on their side for that transition, and that's you know economically rational, right, for them. Um, <clears throat> So with that to the check-in, um, um, <laughs> thanks, Grace. Uh, I, I just got off a call with a group of people uh, uh, called Future Capital that are looking at transforming the nature of business. It started out with a gigantic systems map of the entire everything, which made me think of OGM. Uh, related to that, I'm having a demo next week with the new version of, uh, of, um, of One Planet Living which is a very interesting visual mapping scheme that uh, has an action management component in it, which is intriguing. So after I see that, I wanna make an introduction between this network and that network, because I think there might be some useful cross-linking of tools. <clears throat> um, on personal check-in, um, Stuart, thank you for mentioning the call yesterday. We had our monthly uh, Living Between Worlds call and Ken facilitated masterfully. Uh, bringing um, World Cafe process into Zoom style breakout groups, which people really appreciated. So Ken, thank you again for that. Um, um, let's see, so there's that. I am, um, speaking of white papers and raising capital and so forth, we're, we're getting, we're diving deeper and getting traction on critical path capital. We've identified a first vertical where we think we're gonna try to do a roll up of small and medium sized companies to produce a network of employee owned climate oriented businesses. Um, Grace, the 50 million is an interesting number. I went, uh, the investor group that's most interested in us right now, I said, we're, you know, we're looking to raise <clears> one or $2 million to put all the deals together. And they said, no, no, just go for 50. <laughs> not interesting enough if it's just one or two. I said, great, you know, you're going to help us? They said, yes. So uh, so telling the truth, and Grace, I want to see a white paper for Grace Rahmani, not by Grace, but for Grace. So maybe that's the next one for you to write uh, and just tell the truth on that. Um, in other news, um, I'm finding myself in very strange mood these the moods these days. On the one hand, um, you know, terror at the... Uh, <clears throat> the you know forthright attempt to dismantle American democracy and all the other things that come with that. Uh, you know, the new right article we were talking about before is not just the random emergence of, of intelligent college kids thinking about this stuff. It's a 50 year program to shift the cultural background in this country that's been very focused and very effective and nothing uh, that our folks are doing comes close to the, to the strategic focus um, that the right and their money has been able to do. So on the one hand, um, you know, uh, periodically freaked out about that. On the other hand, fascinated at just the enormous amount of creativity around the world, um, the growth of renewable energy, uh, the grassroots efforts at democracy. And uh, as I said um, with Ken yesterday, some days I feel like I'm just, you know, pulling up, pulling up uh, an easy chair, getting a big bucket of popcorn and watching the show because it is fascinating to be in this moment of history, absolutely unclear where it's going to go. Um, and so I move between, you know, between terror, anger and all that stuff to just, you know, uh, wonder and curiosity and fascination at what might be possible. Uh, and to ground that a little bit uh, as not just being, you know, delusional ramblings, uh, nobody predicted the Kansas vote outcome a couple of weeks ago. Nobody, none of the polar, you know, it was just like it was invisible and there it was. And so uh, while some people say, oh, we're doomed, you know, the Republicans are going to take over Congress in November, 
On the other hand, if the Democrats ran hard on issues where there are super majorities across the country, even in red states, which includes Roe and guns and a couple of other things, uh, there's actually the possibility of a Democrat majority. And then this, you know, this first step inadequate climate bill gets built on and all the other agendas that we talk about. So I'm um, cranking up my referral machine to connect people to uh, various uh, uh, get out the vote and voter organizing efforts um, uh, that are doing very strategically focused work to get to move you know, to move votes in critical districts around the country, not just generally, you know, encourage people to vote, but to target the canvassing efforts, the calling efforts, the door to door efforts, the donation efforts and so forth in places where it can make a strategic difference, both at federal level uh, and at state level, which is really key because we're seeing state legislatures, state governors, state secretaries of state being gradually rolled up by the anti-democratic juggernaut. So as I have those, I'll share those with OGM in the next week or two. And that's it for me for the moment. Thank you, Gil. Thanks. A lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Um, let's go, Rick, Doug Carmichael, Stewart. Thank you, Jerry. Um, <clears throat> I, I invited a woman to join this group uh, that I met on GRC. And I just thought, I don't know what the protocols are about inviting people, but um, if we want diversity, it might be a good idea for each of us to uh, try and reach across younger generation, et cetera, to invite them in and listen. So, and I said I would share her uh, her coursework that uh, is to do with climate change. Anyway, the, the thing that's top of mind for me is um, I've been playing around with this uh, blog post for a while about how to ask big, hairy, audacious questions. And um, I'm going to a writing group this afternoon where I'm going to get some critique on it. And I'm hosting something next week. And it's sort of <clears throat> along the lines of what Ken was talking about, sort of cafe style. It's not me presenting it. It's actually giving a platform for people to think about what are their big, hairy, audacious questions. So I might ask Grace, what is your big, hairy, audacious question in terms of what she wants to do next in life or whatever, or whatever she wants to do, or anyone? But it's really trying to understand where people are coming from and how they frame their own questions. Um, and it's not the, the session isn't going to be about answering the question. It's going to be about actually exploring and questioning your own question and explaining in a way that under, other people understand what you're talking about and then getting feedback from others to see whether they understand it properly before even getting into any of it. So I'll just pop in one question um, into the chat box with a reference of it. This is still work in progress, but if there is interest within uh, this group to host something like this, uh, I'd be happy to do so at some point down the road. And Ken, I suspect we could be, uh, if you're interested, we could chat about how to co-create something along those lines. I'm reckon I'm done speaking. Oh, one last thing. I forgot one thing. The, the issue about going after billionaires. I want to counter that because there is a book um, that Bernie said, the woman who wrote the book on um, rules for revolutionary, which actually was fundraising for Bernie Sanders who did an amazing job of fundraising. And if you're going to co-op people, they have to put, they have to have skin in the game. And I think, you know, relying on visionary billionaires giving $50 billion or whatever handouts for people to go after their pet projects or whatever it is, I don't think is the way that we need to try and scale things up. So anyway, that's my two cents worth. So do you mean Becky Pond? Uh, her name, I, I, Becky Bond, is, rather. I, I think it's Becky Exley who who wrote the book. Oh, uh, that's very funny because I have Becky Bond and Zach Exley having written the book, and I, I'm inferring a certain something from what you just said. Well, uh, the idea behind that is that you actually, <laughs> instead of donating money, they are actually buying into the cryptocurrency, and and there's a new concept that I haven't heard of before. We talk about DAOs, but uh, I, I met this guy in Spain who talks about distributive collaborative organizations. Mm -hmm. And the framework behind that is to break down the silos between the different sectors, because as long as the different sectors remain disconnected, you know, the private, public, and political, uh, we're not going to be as effective. So anyway, mm -hmm. for thought. Um, thank you. Um... And there are many different efforts to try to figure out how this thing works, um, many. And uh, we're so far not curating them all that well, but I think we can. 
Uh, thanks for posting your question in the chat, Rick. We will we will deal with it asynchronously that way. And let's go to Doug Carmichael, Stuart, and Jesse up. So it seems to me that we are badly stuck. Uh, and there's a lot of energy behind trying new ways of doing things without facing the logical problem that any new ec economic activity, progressive or not, creates more CO2. There's just no way to avoid that fact. Uh, so I think we're not facing the logical issues squarely that put us in the, uh, that help clarify the trap that we're in. Uh, thinking about this this week, I thought, what is the best frame for myself to be in, to be thinking now? And what I came to was the transformation in a society requires two things, wealth and imagination. And it's the imagination where we really are falling short. And by imagination, I mean things like going to the kind of mind that Nietzsche had. Uh, to dark places, to really creative, strange places. Uh, the speculation as to what kind of society we want really just ends, ends up mostly, so far as I can see, is just more activity that's economic that pays off for people like us. And that just is not deep enough uh, to cope. Uh, I've been thinking a lot, and I don't have any conclusions yet, about how to develop what you might call a deep mind in relation to imagination. But I think the combination of wealth, which we have in society, and the imagination, which we don't have, is the key to where the future might be. When you say wealth, Doug, do you mean monetary wealth? Do you mean some no, other I mean the whole, wealth? Uh, I started with money, but then I realized, come on, uh, ideas are wealth. Uh, well, so you have to be you have to be careful because that that word is easily taken to mean assets in the bank enumerated absolutely. in USD, right? Right. Yeah. And I I started there myself, and okay. I thought that's just not good enough. Uh, that wealth is too wrapped up in consumerism, and petty goals, and petty transformations, and we need to go much deeper. Thank you. Um, and and I have a deep well of stories and ideas about how the consumerization of our world basically made us stupid and got rid of uh, humans. If you look at any five-year-old, humans are innately curious and interested and innovative and want to connect and all that kind of stuff, but we stamp it out of us. Our socialization processes and our cultural assumptions stamp it out of us really effectively so that then we have to train people how to be innovative and curious and it killed me when i read that they were trying to teach children empathy by bringing babies into like third grade classrooms and passing the baby around and i'm like what have we done that we don't have empathy in third grade and we have to try to teach it this is really bad go ahead doug so uh, something i've thought about for a long time why is it that third graders all know they can paint and sing and fifth graders don't and we call it education. To me, I think that the issue might be that society must teach a bulk of the oncoming generation that they can't be creative, because if they all were creative, society would just blow up. Uh, too much entropy, too much uh, going in different directions. So it's a, it's a, uh, anyway, you get the point. Uh, it's very much something like that. There's a more structured uh, approach to talking about that in education, specifically called the hidden education, the hidden curriculum of schooling, which is like nominally I'm teaching your child to to write and do math, but actually I'm teaching them to learn their place in the hierarchy of control, to be quiet because I am God and I could put a mark on their record that'll last for a really long time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and what I'm suggesting is that's not just a bad thing. Uh, it might be part of society's protecting itself from too much creativity. Yeah, and and Julian, thanks for putting the the play, uh, the Lego play thing up. Play is just so important, and 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 just a small thing. Maybe thinking back on our group process here and what we do and how we go about it. For me, this little thing about looking up links and pasting links and trying to beat Pete to find a, a link and put it in the chat and whatever is play. Like like for me, these conversations are play. I, I think of our, our, our Thursday calls as like, like sandbox playtime with really with people I love. And, and that makes it fun. 
but I know that I'm a couple sigmas off of mean on some of these things. Yeah, Grace, beat P, but not in the other, other meaning of beat, right? Um, oh, who knows? Oh, really? <laughs> you washed your hands of that, uh, of that implication. Whatever you're into, man, like ah. not, my, not my business. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so there's so some anyway. wonderful books on play, like yeah. Piaget's Play Dreams and Imitation in Childhood, uh, Hoisinger's Homo Ludens. Uh, these books say that play is not just an ancillary thing to a good society. They're absolutely critical for human development. Uh, Piaget makes it clear you cannot have knowledge without play where play is essentially treating a this as a that and looking at the consequences. So uh, yeah, absolutely. This was a, a theme I ran working at Lego. This is a theme I ran into quite frequently. And is it uh, not not just Piaget, but it also goes back to Montessori and Piaget was a fan of her too. Yes. Yep. Um, ironically, I met uh, Stuart Brown many years ago, who was the head of the Institute for Play. And I think we did an interview together or something like that. I'm sorry, but he was the least playful person I've met in a really long time. <laughs> he was kind of on a mission. And it was just really downheartening to me or dispiriting. At the end of the call, I was like, oh, man, Institute for Play, really? Um, anyway, uh, we have in our queue, Stuart Jesse Pete. Uh, one hey, so, interjection is that the toy business is a lot of really hard work. So. Yeah. Yeah. So is comedy. Yeah. yeah. So uh, picking up on, on Doug's piece of um, the importance of creativity, uh, in part spurred on by a, uh, a fortune cookie, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly focused on using my own creativity at this point in time. Stuart, I use the word imagination, not creativity. And I think well, they're, import they're importantly different. Um, yeah, but they're, they're, they're within the same realm. I mean, imagination and creativity, to me, there's so much hand in glove in those, uh, Doug. And I think this is where, in some ways, uh, you know, we um, undercut each other uh, by making these kinds of distinctions. Um, the poetic sense in me says that there's so much hand in glove and that words are so inadequate sometimes. I think that we all know what we're, what we're talking about when we talk about imagination and creativity and how people define that in their own lexicon uh, <clears throat> can have distinctions. So to try and put them into narrow boxes um, I don't think is real useful. Um, I usually don't do that, but I couldn't help. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't help, uh, but to allow my own critical thinking to to come in. Anyway, that being said, um, I've been uh, home with COVID for the last couple of weeks, and it's been, in some ways, except for except for two very fluey days. Um, not so bad. It's been a, a, a very productive, in some ways, um, retreat. Uh, I don't wish it for people, but um, <laughs> you got to make the best of stuff that happens. Um, so two projects advancing. One, uh, poetry. I go back and forth between wanting to self-publish and, uh, and, and finding a publisher. Um, I'm sure that that will, you know, figure itself out, but it's it's, it's actually ready. Um, it's been a, over a 20 year project and it just is, uh, it's ready, I'm done. I can't look at the poems anymore. I've got another month and a half of, of daily editing of one poem. Um, so that's, that's kind of fun, though when you finish a big project, um, it leaves space. It's a little bit of postpartum. Uh, two, um, I just signed a represented, representation agreement with a, a, an agent lawyer from a, a very well-regarded small entertainment firm in, um, in Los Angeles that has all the skills that I need for the, um, what I thought was a piece of science fiction, but maybe not, about how do we move the world from where we are to where we might like it to be. As I layer in the creativity in it and go from a tome um, expressing the whole 
to 35 individual segments of, of social society and interaction that needs addressing, and I kind of layer in um, scenarios, it, it's becoming more of a reality that, hey, this could really be something. And the validation of having an agent working on this on contingency is even more um, heartening in some ways. So this is kind of fun going forward. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is with all our, our machinations and conversations about more diversity, more diversity, I had this little brain fart the other day. Wouldn't it be really interesting if a group of old white men lead us through the morass of societal challenges that we're in right now? And the first thing that came up was, you know, World War II, uh, 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 being able to navigate through that. Um, that's just a piece of uh, 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 <laughs> fantasy, what have you. Just a, a piece of humor is, is, is what it is, actually. Seeing the synapse of that juxtaposed to all of our current conversations. So that's my check-in. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Cool stuff. Um, two sort of, wait, maybe one playful suggestion about getting your poems in the world. And, and, and I'm always about alternate ways, but maybe you could pull a Jenny Holster or a Ministry of Reshelving kind of thing. Jenny Holster was an, uh, an artist who put aphorisms on park benches and in other public spaces, and you just kind of bump into them. <clears throat> really uh, pretty interesting. And then uh, the Ministry of Reshelving would go into uh, into bookstores and libraries and like move books around, uh, kind of, you know, like stuff that used to be science fiction and is now current events, uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, and Eric has a nice video about using Mark's MX tool to generate and regenerate poetry than Emily Dickinson's style, or is it specifically from Emily Dickinson's words? I'm forgetting. It's, a it's remix. from first lines of her poems, and it just generates a new poem. <laughs> Thank you. So it's not generating brand new text. It's actually re remixing uh, first yeah. lines of, of Dickinson's poems. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And Eric, if you want to put the link to that uh, video in the chat. That'd be yeah, great. I put my links already at the top of the chat, so when you get it. <laughs> Great, thank awesome. you. Awesome, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, cool, so we have Jesse, Pete, Eric. Hello, everyone. I am not going to be on video today because I'm recovering from surgery, um, but it's just a pleasure to listen to you all. And um, I'm going to diverge a little here and, the, and then also converge back to um, the, the topic of imagination. Um, as I work in the corporate world and toggle between uh, community spaces, um, I'm thinking about these days how we have individual excellence, and then we can go up to like family excellence, and then team excellence, and community excellence, and you know org excellence, and then global excellence. And we're talking about the SDGs at that point, uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals. And in a way, there's a scale of excellence where you just have to start with the basic needs, basic needs of breathing, eating, drinking, sleeping, all the way to um, being able to be capable of using those, tapping into those needs and so forth. But what I'm noticing is that there is indicators of whatever we're talking about on a family level or in a, on a, a corporate level or a community level, or just even this call that the conversations are either in protection mode or in growth mode. And you can't be in both together at the same time. You have to either be in one or the other. So they're indicators of being in protection mode or in growth mode at any level. And when you talk about imagination, that's like an indicator of growth mode, right? And you can't, you can't have that 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 imagination when you're in protection mode. So I'm just th those 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 concepts and those um, thoughts are showing up for me. Nothing more than that. Just wanted to put it out there. Mm, Jesse, thank you. Um, and you say that you can't be in both modes. Is that your hunch? Is that based on stuff you you've read? Because sometimes when I hear dichotomies, like I hear people say humans don't multitask well, mm -hmm. and, and my own take is like you know, talk to your average mom and you'll discover a human who is multitasking like crazy. Uh, 
S.D. Solomon Gray, a dear friend, has a thesis about multi-minding, which is a form of multitasking, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, I don't believe that people can only single task. In fact, the world would be better off in my own little worldview if we had modes where we are completely focused and all disturbances are, are shushed away. And then modes where we're like Bruce Lee in the field, like dealing with, with assaulting emails and tweets and whatever else in the most efficient way possible. I want that environment as my as my desktop kind of thing. So sorry, that was a that was a bit of a tangent. But but what can you say a little bit more about this? Uh, you know, either reacting or fearful versus imagination, creativity kind of access. Yeah, thank you for that. It it's almost as if it's you um you can't feel love and be scared at the same time, but maybe maybe scientifically you can. Your let your brain can be lit, lit up at the same time in different parts of the brain. Who knows? But and you can use money as a, an example of a mechanism that could be used for both protection and growth. But um, so you can't really. It, it really depends on your your intention in the moment. I guess the the intention is everything. It starts the intention. I love that. Me too. Um, Grace has a thought, and then anybody else who wants to jump in, please do. Grace. Yeah, this really connects up. I mean, what you're saying about this um, protective mode or creative mode really connects up a lot with the um, communications modalities that I've been um, working with or trained in or that I live with. And there's this, and I would say there's a couple of aspects of that. One aspect is really this am I like in some ways how quickly do I react, react to what you said like, do I really fully absorb where you are and get where you are and then either respond or not respond in a way to what you had to say you know and I, I and 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 that's part of it part of it is this I think for me the creative mode is also how deep can you go into either first principles like, oh, I'm starting from, like, for me, I'm starting when I talk about economy, what's an economy? To me, an economy is to have life thrive. It was very, very, like, like, but I was, I had to erase everything that everybody told me about what an economy is before I kind of started, you know, how back would I, far back would I go? And I think also how, how much are you willing to deal with your own shadow? Because we're because this reactive mode that Jesse's talking about is like something got triggered in me and now I've got to react and protect something. Whereas, you know, I came onto this calling, like one of the things that I've really resolved for ah, myself so in where I am right now is I'm really committed to saying what I don't know. Because, I mean, I'm very arrogant, if none of you have noticed, like I'm so arrogant that I think that I'm going to change the entire world economy. Um, and and I, I have this way of being that makes it seem like I've got it all together. And there's stuff I really don't know how to do. And so I, I'm just really committed to being with that, like being willing to expose my ignorance and my shadow. And I think that that, that, that connects, like you can be in creative mode if you're willing, if, if you don't have to protect that. It's like, you know what, I actually, I don't know. Well, I don't have well, to know. Well, yeah, I don't have to be smarter than the person talking. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Grace. Doug? Yeah, uh, back to imagination. I think the difference between imagination and creativity is that imagination is slightly more open to the dark side than the idea of creativity. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, did you want to comment back or anyone else about the thoughts that Jesse put on the table? Yeah, I just love the conversation. Oops, you muted yourself accidentally. Sorry, my my son just turned on the coffee maker. <laughs> it was very loud. <laughs> um, I appreciate everyone's uh, contributions to this talk because really you're personalizing and making meaning out of whatever I just said. Um, when we all have different parts inside us, uh, internal family systems, and yes, one part can be lit up and saying something fearful, and then two seconds later it can be from a love standpoint or whatever protection mode versus creative mode and it could go back and forth within just milliseconds so i can understand the feeling of it happening at the same time um, but it's just a, it's fascinating just to keep it as a 
um, underlying thought process as you as you create today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carranza. Hi, um, I, I would love to play here. And in matter most, if you could make two lists, 10 items each, one list imagination and what comes in your mind when you think about imagination, the other creativity, what comes in your mind when you think about creativity and just post it in the matter most. That's what MX is all about, to see what is in your mind that you have relation to a concept, imagination, the other concept, creativity. Um, I really busy today, so I'll do it um, a little later myself, but uh, I would just love to see what, what everyone puts up. Um, Thank you. If you haven't already, could you put that prompt in the chat, in the, in the Mattermost channel? I will, I'm busy, my, my computer or died, so I'm someone writing else, all If the, anyone else can notes, volunteer to do it. But uh, yeah, if somebody else can volunteer, please. Um, we'll get it up. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we are at Pete Eric John. Thank you. Um, it's always fun talking with everybody here. Uh, today for me, my check-in is a little bit of show and tell. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Actually, before I do that, uh, it's going to be about uh, AI image generators. Um, turn your head away if you hate this already. Um, uh, but I will try not to hurt your eyes too much. Um, it's an interesting new space that I kind of fell into, and uh, I think it's going to be really big. Um, uh, some of the some of the kind of revolutions we've seen before that you can probably remember: um, synthesizers invaded music. Um, uh, not the original genius, Wendy Carlos. Uh, she was doing something that was amazingly difficult, uh, but but later in the 90s or something like that, um, it, it got to be where you could play music without being able to play an instrument. Um, and then um, uh, you would think that, oh my gosh, that means that all the musicians are out of a job um, and nobody will ever actually play an instrument anymore. And that's not true. Uh, people still love to play instruments and are really good at it. And I love to listen to people who play instruments well. I also love to listen to people who can't play an instrument but can conjure up um, uh, amazing music out of the synthesized sounds um, that are avail available to them on their iPad or their, or their Mac or whatever. Um, so I feel like uh, images are going to be kind of similar. Um, uh, so maybe you know, maybe you don't. Um, there are a bunch of tools nowadays where you can type a description into uh, a bot and the bot will say, let me draw something that matches that description for you. Um, and that's kind of literally the way it works. The systems have looked at billions of images and they kind of, and, and their descriptions. Um, and so you type a description and it's like, yeah, it, it kind of rummages through this attic of literally billions of images and kind of starts to make something that looks like the thing that um, uh, that you described. And it's kind of an interesting, the, um, uh, they, they call them generative adversarial networks. Um, the, it's, it's kind of a, I have this interesting picture in my head. Um, one of the jobs of, there's, there's two beasts inside the bot. Uh, one of the beasts, takes uh, just noise, like random, like uh, like static from your TV, and it tries to make it look more like your thing, like uh, Rick Astley's face with a Santa hat or something like that. Um, and then there's another one called the Discriminator. Uh, this beast looks at that that generated thing, and it says, no, nah, man, it sucks. Yeah, do it again. So it will box the other one. On, on, it's like Punch and Judy um, playing together. Um, so I, I have that image in my mind of these these bots. Um, the other thing is these uh, these things take uh, a hellacious amount of compute power. Um, so right now, all the people doing image AI image generation are also burning up the planet the same way the crypto people are, or they uh, or the, the render farms are. Problem for another day. So let me do a quick show and tell, um, and then we can maybe move on. So. Today, I haven't been doing the, the link uh, thing because in the background, I was doing a different kind of play that I do, which is Photoshop. 
Um, so uh, this is something that, this is the original version that a tool called Midjourney gave me when I said an ethereal landscape with eightfold symmetry. Uh, it gave me a couple of different variations on a theme, and this is the one that I, I liked. And I actually thought this was really cool, and I kept looking at it, looking at it, and like, you know that reflection down there? I really like the idea of it being like inverted and different than the sky, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not going to read well for people. Uh, so during this call, um, I apologize for multitasking. This is the way I, I pay attention to people talking is by doodling um, or, or linking. Um, so uh, what I've done is spent the call replacing that uh, the lake there with the reflection of the sky and it's pr in perspective and it's got a whole bunch of effects making it darker and stuff like that so it actually looks fairly real. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to show and tell real quick, uh, that, that the previous one was Midjourney. These are a bunch of images that uh, Dolly and I created. Um, Dolly is, is Midjourney and Dolly are kind of the best right now. There's another one called Stable Diffusion, which is basically as good as Midjourney and, and Dolly. Um, Midjourney tends to do this kind of, the, the creators of Midjourney wanted it to be kind of painterly. And this isn't the only style that Midjourney does, but um, it's, it's a lot more painterly. Um, Dolly can do some real photorealistic stuff. Um, I've shrunk these a bit, um, but the, the real images aren't a lot bigger. They don't have a lot more detail. If you blow them up, they get fuzzy and weird. Um, but the thing that really strikes me about Dolly is these are all synthetic images. Um, the Punch and Judy show made these out of noise um, based on a, on a fairly simple description that I had, you know, a, a, a green metal toy frog or a purple metal toy frog um, or happy expressions or um, uh, dinosaur in the sky, that kind of stuff. Um, some of these, the, these get different styles. Uh, the AI image generators, uh, you can tell them to, you know, make something from the 50s or make something stained glass or make something from the, the uh, 19th century. Um, and, it, and it will make it, you know, uh, in, in a different art style as well as a different subject. But so if, if I can make images like this, like kind of at the flick of a button, it's actually a little bit more involved than that. But um, uh, with not a lot of art training and certainly without any like skill to, to draw, um, the, I think the, the world is going to shift kind of and we're going to end up in this um, odd place. It will feel very odd that um, all of a sudden we have people who call themselves artists or illustrators who can't art and can't illustrate, um, but they can be imaginative and creative uh, and come up with conceptual stuff that nobody's ever seen before um, because there wasn't uh, a person who had the paintbrush um, and, you know, 20 or 30 years of, of practice and an art history at background, um, just somebody off the street like me that, that made something really cool and interesting. So um, one of the bad things that happen is all of a sudden you get floods. Uh, if, you're, if you're on social media too much nowadays, you'll get a bunch of people posting like, look what I did with Dolly or look what I did with Midjourney. And after a while, they kind of get repetitive um, a little bit. Uh, it takes a lot of curation uh, to find the good ones, kind of, and find the novel ones. Um, so we're going to get this flood of junk, um, and then we're going to get a reaction of people going, oh my god, please don't show me any more AI art stuff ever again. I don't want it. Um, uh, but there's, there's actually signal in there. Um, and so we're going to have to build tools. Um, I'm, I'm thinking uh, we're going to be building... Um, social, you know, ranking, rating, and sorting s stuff. Uh, we've done that, you know, since Flickr. Uh, there's, there's ways that people, you know, process the images collaboratively and say, these ones are better, or these ones are worse. This one looks like, you know, this one looks like the 1950s. This one looks like, um, you know, painting by Renoir. Um, so uh, the thing is, we're going to have, like, um, orders of magnitudes, more images to sort and sift through. Um, and, and then th I think there's going to be some interesting uh, ecosystems. Uh, another way I kind of think of me and Dolly working together on stuff, and one of the interesting things that somebody else said I hadn't realized that I thought, um, it, it took somebody else saying it, um, 
you actually end up in kind of a conversation with the bots or the Punch and Judy show. Uh, it's like, well, that's not what I meant, but what you made is really interesting, and let me explore that a little further. So you, you end up, not that the AI is talking to you, but you end up navigating into spaces that you wouldn't have gone otherwise because you've got uh, an AI kind of in front of you with a machete uh, swinging at vines and stuff, finding new things for you, new vistas to explore, right? So, um, so uh, as I go through this and curate something, I, you know, the, me and the, the robot in front of me are swinging the machete and we end up in this clearing and wow, this is a really cool vision of something that I think nobody's ever seen before. Um, and by the way, bot, could you make it bigger? If you start making it bigger um, to, to keep the compute intensity down, they, the images are like really small. They're like, they, they come out a thousand by a thousand pixels, uh, a megapixel. Um, the, the actual resolution of them is worth, worthwhile resolution is smaller than that. It's like a quarter of a megapixel or something. So when you blow them up, they just get junky. Um, there's different ways you can blow them up. You have another AI that just all it knows how to do is blow things up and make them look better, but then they can get weird. Um, so there are some of them, it's like, oh my God, I would love to have this framed on my wall, except it's this little postage stamp thing. I need a real artist who can draw at scale to redraw this idea for me at scale, you know? So um, we're gonna end up with all kinds of workflows and ecosystems where people need to help each other process this, you know, huge morass of, of new images and creativity. Um, and I think there's a lot of new markets in there uh, for people who, know how to do prompt engineering, how to, how to write the text that gets the, the, the interesting images. Um, people ha who know how to make them bigger, how to upscale them. People who have fine art degrees and say, well, actually this is really cool, but you know, you've misframed it a little bit. The, the bot misframed it for you. Let me fix that. Let me make it a lot bigger for you in a way that's, that's attractive instead of ugly. So um, I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to send a, a link to a Mattermost channel. It's a tiny Mattermost channel right now, but um, I'm, I'm thinking through some of this stuff on that channel. Um, uh, if you want to see more, uh, I, I promise not to show AI art very much uh, in places uh, non-consensually. Uh, so this channel will be a consensual place <laughs> uh, to post more AI art. Hopefully, ho hopefully mostly good and not bad. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, it's sort of a meditation on what's happening to art and text and everything else. The computer generated X <clears throat> is suddenly on a, on a tear. Julian, go ahead. So two things I wanted to bring up uh, relevant to what Pete was just talking about. <clears throat> In the late seventies, uh, Hanna-Barbera introduced an assistive system to create animation. And uh, the entire animation staff went out on strike because the initial impressions were that they were going to be replaced by computers. And big kerfuffle, this went on for a bit until finally everybody realized that it was another tool, much like switching from a fountain pen to a ballpoint pen, the computer assist technology was another tool for the animators to use and the animators stayed employed. Uh, there used to be a job called tweening in animation studios, which is you'd get a cell and another cell and the tweeners would just do the in-between cells to do the frame rate you were looking for for animation. It might have been that, it might have been yeah. something else, but those things go away, but then the tweeners get to do something better. Right. That's what happens is that you get rid of the drudgery and then people can be even more expressive and creative because they don't have to deal with drudgery all the time. Uh, the other point I wanted to bring up was the drummer for the, the Rolling Stones, the late Charlie Watts, and reading his obituary found out that one thing that gave him a distinctive sound was that he would always hit the beat a fraction of a second behind Keith Richards. And the, so the two things I'm bringing up here is that you come up with all this automation, but there's still no substitute for talent, and there's no encoding for talent in, in, yeah, in computer science. So. Love that. Um, we have a few people left in the queue, but not much time. We've kind of hit our max, but I was going to say, Eric, if you want to, this is kind of the queue that I have right now. Uh, my apologies to those of us at the tail. But Eric, if you wanted to jump in, I also wanted to thank Pete for the, the Plexus Places post that ran this morning, basically saying, here are our conversations, here are the different ways that we're talking. It's really beautiful. It's Jerry Frozen. We've never have, 
have uh, had Jerry Frizz before. Press it on. It's, it's a New York thing. Quick, a, take a picture. It's a good look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the jazz hands. <laughs> let's all let's all uh, try and match the. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure nice take a sure there. There. Anybody have any idea what he's saying right now? What's that? What's he saying right now? <laughs> Is he recording on his PC? <laughs> or, yeah, that's the question. Is he recording locally or in the cloud? And here, and here, let me show you such and such in my brain. Oh, he dropped out. Yeah. Eric, you want to go? Okay, well, I was going to say uh, I've been playing with Mark's MX system for two weeks, and it's just sparking all kinds of dreams about where it could go. And I could do a screen share if anyone wants to yeah. hang around a little. Okay. Emily's busy. Um, thank you, Eric. I just realized why I fell off, but we can report back on that later. Every day at this time when I logged in for the first time at Betaworks, it's kicking me off because it wants me to click on the approve thing. I'm like, why am I falling off? So Eric, you're muted. OK. We're not hearing you, Eric. Yeah, you're still muted. OK, now you should be unmuted. Yes. Yay. OK, so if you see this Emily Dickinson poetry generator up here, just created a new poem. This is my letter to the world. The future never spoke. A little madness in the spring, et cetera. Isn't that cool? But now I want to show you if I go further into this is my letter to the world. I hit escape. I type this is my just a few characters. It finds the thought that matches and I hit enter. And now I have references to Walt Whitman, to the Yorp poem, to Dickinson's season three, Leaves of Grass, and an attachment with a tweet that I made. So here is how I envision references to external objects in MX, just like the brain has attachments. Well, I could have a decentralized hyperdrive. So like I have my local copy of the hyperdrive here and I could go into my tweets and I could copy this tweet and look at it. I mean, I'm thinking through the manual steps that could be automated later. And uh, like the videos here, I have a YouTube link. And for the same video, I have a local download in the videos directory. And this is the video from Dead Poet Society of Robin Williams teaching the class about YOP. Okay, so. Oh, captain, my captain. Yes. Eric, Eric, I'm wondering what would happen if you connected all this stuff up to the brain and then didn't tell Jerry. Wait, wait, stop. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, so I'm dreaming about how to build this decentralized so that um, we could share our MXs with each other. And we could uh, eventually import export between the brain and MX, because what I've done is I've saved all my brains into a zip file, and my, my brains only take up 96 megabytes. I don't know how many Jerry's are. <laughs> What's Karanda doing? <laughs> yeah. So if you're interested in uh, exploring this, uh, send me a note on Mattermost. We're going to have meetings with Mark and his, um, a few people who've who like Fox Pro or old tech or who just dream about ways of integrating this. So, um, so Mark, got anything to say about this? Hmm. Oh. The whole point of a local global mind is that it's his, <laughs> completely his. Mm -hmm. No one else's. He gets to do all the this has meaning to me. Right. There's no bullshit from outside. There's no bullshit from a bullshit factory. There's no bullshit from advertisements. There's no bullshit from television. There's no bullshit from anybody else. Yeah, it's I could watch that video Eric. without ads. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Eric, hooray! Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's taken 38 years for someone to basically actually try it out. Yeah, and bring it up at D webcam go to see what people are interested. I I I may not be able to uh, check in, but I will be talking. I love my proposal. Great. And uh, 
Eric, I just want to say one thing. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's all just simple connections between tools. If but you but you're also it. illustrating it in a way that we can all be like, oh, okay, I got that. That makes kind of sense to me. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you might have the last word today. Uh, actually, you won't because Ken has offered to read a poem to take us out. But first, we'll go to Michael. I, I just want to um, offer a question, caveat, observation on what Pete um, was showing. You know, one of the things that uh, as 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 you know, Grace was mentioning the the font pollution thing that happened when uh, you know fonts were introduced in Microsoft Word, and you know we all know about the 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 rapid ascension of Comic Sans um, when non graphic designers got got their hands on on typeface choices, um, and the thing that's really interesting is like in all those cases you had um you had the fear like the fear of the tweeners you know and the and the, the Hanna Barbera workers that you know they were going to lose out and graphic designers thinking oh when everybody has you know desktop graphic design tools there won't be a place for us and then the slow realization that oh there's still a difference in quality and it's just a tool and blah 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 um I, I, I there's something happening with visuals that's that's different that I'm fascinated by, and that is that <clears throat> when you think of um, the difference between an artificial intelligence creating music, um, the difference between using every note played by <clears throat> every possible instrument and some instruments that don't exist um, and some, you know, uh half steps that aren't in you know most music that that is sampled that's a different thing than sampling existing tunes and one of the things that i see happening in some of these um artificially created dolly images and other other i've played around with some other things is that you're you're picking up photographs um and and paintings and illustrations and stylistic things that do exist that were somebody's assembled creative work that's sort of more like a sample and a piece of music um and the and what what eric just did with the with the poetry generation was tell us where this stuff that had been artificially assembled came from mm -hmm. and i think in 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 artificial imagery yes. on dali i want to know what the who photographed the photograph that is the primary sample source around which the other things are built you know somebody i'm like pete and i have argued about this a little bit but i would bet you that there are a few pictures of metal frogs um, one of which generated that green one and a different one of which generated the purple one. Um, and maybe one of them started off red, not purple, you know, and, and was a, but, but they're definitely stylistic things that come from, you know, a, a nose in a face comes from a particular photograph. We need that to be available information and for, you know, for that sampling to be at least acknowledged, if not if not credited, if not paid for, because um, it's different than just pixels or notes, you know. Well, basically, what um, uh, you know, all this unpaid expression of, of translators that have done translations that Google's just slurping up and. Um, basically saying, well, thank you for doing all this work for free. We have the biggest computers, so we can just, you know, take all this and, you know, make a profit on it. And who is that wonderful person, Jaron Lanier? He, he basically stresses this point over and over and over and over again, that uh, it's not the computers, it's the people who basically identified the meaning and some algorithms can basically you know, leverage that already existing meaning that people in their minds have created and expressed. And uh, this is a very interesting paradox for our time. And I do, I just want to interject one more thing. I do think that 
the difference between dexterity and virtuosity with your hands and being able to conceive of something, you know, as, as pizza, you know, there, there are just like there are, are um, people who uh, have an idea for a plot, but they aren't great wordsmiths or people who have um, a, you know, can hum a tune, but they don't know how to play an instrument. That kind of creativity can be enhanced and expressed by these technologies, but if you're going to use, if you're going to use source material from other creators, just you know, credit it. Um, I'd I'd love a machine where I could you know do a sketch and have the rendering finished, or hum a tune and have it orchestrated in the style that I want. But if it's literally using the work of other people, credit it. Um. I'm going to take us out of the call pretty soon because I actually have to head off to a couple of meetings unless I should leave it open and whoever wants to close it closes it that'll work fine in which case I'm going to ask Ken to read his poem and then I'll skip off and pass the con will that work let's do that because it sounds like it's still hot here and I'm perfectly happy for, for the conversation to go on Ken please and I'm going to read this, then I have to go. Um, because Emily Dickinson was evoked today, along with Jerry's brain, I came up with her poem about the brain is wider than the sky. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea. For hold them blue to blue the one the other will absorb, as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for half them, pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, as syllable from sound. Nice find. Thanks, thanks, Ken. I really appreciate that. Uh, who would like- That's dedicated to, to you, Jerry and Mark, and everybody else here who's got a brain and a sky and a, an ocean they want to play with. Who would like to receive the con from me as I jump off? I'm going to go. Good to see you all. Take care. got to go. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stuart, do you want it? Or Mark Carranza? Yeah, um, Mark. Stuart, not me. No, Stuart was raising his hand. Uh, Michael? Yeah, OK, good. Uh, let me just find you in the list. There you are, Pink. And thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Oh, cool. Uh, I can't tell you, Eric, how yeah. thrilled I am to see you basically putting your thinking in this simplest possible relational structure yep. and doing your own damn thing that has absolutely nothing to do with me. It yeah. is so thrilling. I cannot tell you. I'm just thrilled. Oh, thanks. <laughs> What I find is the fast data entry works a lot for me because that's what I grew up with. And ever since we started doing data entry on the web, I've just been so frustrated and this just brought it back and it's natural to me. So the secret is um, basically it's a, um, interface, it's a UI I developed um, for using while really, really fucked up on drugs. So the, the best way that I've found to um, analyze a UI is to get stoned, high, whatever, and basically try to use Microsoft Word or try to use <laughs> anything. And basically it's by making yourself intentionally stupid that you find what's not globally simple and it's just i don't know it's just yeah. a very simple but of course you know illegal thing to do simplicity not, is hard not, yes not in california anymore for for certain mm -hmm. substances but right uh, um but we need to map all the innovations that came from people who used those drugs in the 60s or whenever <laughs> um it's, you'd be surprised uh, how many innovations have come from that <laughs> You know, I, 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 I will do a short check-in. Um, the people at UFCamp love my proposal. And, uh, you know, UFCamp is just going to be 400 people of the most creative, 
people on the planet just getting together in the Mendocino Woods and the fog. Um, I wish y'all could be there. Um, I I certainly um, uh, would love to meet in person, uh, and that we never have is just absolutely fine. Um, that we will in the future, I look forward to. In fact, I invite you all right now to my 60th birthday party, Ooh. end of November. Nice. Um, please, please try to make something happen and to come to San Francisco because okay. I will have one hell of a party and there will be the best, the best <laughs> friends. Thank you. That, you know, this is a proposition that does not, you know, somebody said does not broke for evidence, but I assert that I have the best friends that anybody's had in the history of the planet. And we appreciate you. Um, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the other people. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That you haven't met, that you don't even know about. Uh, I know. Just, <laughs> oh, they're, they're just so incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a celebration time. Um, it feels like um, I'm a, I've been on a nonstop celebration from about July 15th, and it's uh, going to be just one hell of a D-Web camp, and then it's going to be the next uh, point is the hell of the birthday party. So, uh, yeah, just soak it all up and um, yeah, <laughs> enjoy it. It's been a long trip uh, from uh, a lot of pain, uh, through a lot of pain. Um, the only way um, out is through. Yeah. to uh, um, basically do baby steps of healing and then keep on going. Yes. Um, where all those you know, baby steps converge into kind of an uh, exponential kind of thing. And it's a fucking hell of a ride right now. So I'm having fun. Good. And uh, I, I'm glad to be with uh, the three of you, four of you. I'm not sure about Gil. Um, <laughs> this recording. That's it's a link. <laughs> it's just a link. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, that's my check-in. Um, Thank you. Uh, Pete, Eric, Michael, I'm listening. Uh, Michael, I'd, I'd love to pick up uh, that discussion at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. No, I mean, I, I mean, but I also, I, I think about it in terms of Memex and, 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 you know, in terms of yeah. what Eric's doing and just sort of like how how the the contribution i mean i you know i i was i was describing it in the sort of defensive way of of, of you know artists and photographers um but it it also like wants to be a positive opt-in force um like i don't know where you know if the dolly the dolly samples may all be public domain and you know Whatever. I think it's uh, so. But, so but, I, I'm going to guess that um, that Dolly really does synthesize stuff. Uh, there aren't any uh, metal toy frogs that that look like that. It knows what frogs look like. It knows what metal toys look like, and it knows what a you know a photographic lens looks like, and all that kind of stuff. The, it's it's very similar. Mark Mark brought up uh, Google Translate. Um, so I think it's a lot like. Um, you know, Google's to get Google Translate to work, Google sucked up billions or trillions of words that were mapped by humans, right? And so, um, there's there's a I and and I, Dolly works the same way. Um, you know, it's not that uh, it's not like I can make up a novel sentence and Google can still translate it. It's not because there's an instance of that translation somewhere that somebody wrote down. It's that it's blended together five or six or 20 or 100 or 600 or 1,000 different translations to get the same meaning. Um, so at some point, the, the contribution kind of fades away. It's, it's, I, I don't think you can say who made this. You can say that Google scooped up a bunch of cultural um, Google and whoever else, OpenAI, have scooped up a bunch of cultural asset and is now monetizing it. Um, I, th I think that's a fair thing to say. Um, there's another weird thing. It's like, how could you get how could you get a thing like Google Translate except by doing that? Um, so, and how could Google have found the 
probably hundreds of thousands of tr human translators going for back, you know, 150 years or something like that, who've done translations. How could you? How could Google have found all of those people to give them blended credit for, you know, the the sentence that just got translated? That the images I think are very similar to that. I I can also think of the same thing in music synthesis, right? Um, if if I get a beautiful bell sound with a lot of reverb and stuff like that, the way that that synthesis happened is some some engineer or set of engineers was at the final kind of assembly point of a bunch of um, domain knowledge and sampling and and physics and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, you know, there's some guy who, some, some woman who figured out the, the formula for, you know, just tapping on metal and, and getting resonances and stuff like that. And that got folded into that. And, you know, somebody did a sample, probably a hundred samples of different bells in different parts of the world. And, you know, all of that stuff gets smushed together into this, you know, amazing sample. When you press the a key on a keyboard, it goes, uh, you know, and... It's like, how would you, it's, it's it, at some point it kind of becomes cultural memory rather than, you know, individual sampling. Um, so I think those, those th th three things for me are very similar. The cultural sampling that Dolly does to create an image is very similar, I think, to the cultural sampling that Google did for um, translation and very similar to the way that we've built synthesize synthesize sounds and nobody gets credit for the synthesized sounds you know maybe the final person sometimes you know i sample packed from you know bought from blah 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 and they got you know some small amount of money to pay for it but they're standing on the shoulders of many 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 other people um who you know did or didn't get credit probably didn't yeah yeah, I mean, you and I have had this this exchange before, Eric and Mark. We, we, you know, just w where I, I think um, I am I am less convinced that uh, than Pete that there are not recognizable just just from the experimentation I've done and and a little bit of reading that there are not discernible portions of you know existing that it's not it's not a collection of the right pixels and knowledge that there's a little bit of of whether it's I, quite there, sampling there or definitely, not, you I, know. there are definitely times where you can see you know oh that's a salvador dolly eye or something like that or no right. or something like yeah, that yeah that's all i mean um yeah. but but even then it's probably salvador dolly sampled over you know 30 years or something like that from a bunch of different influences um in general, I, the, the images that I see coming out of Dolly, they're, they're just like, you can tell this to mash up ideas that like just have never been mashed up before, right? And sure. it just does yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah. it understands geometry. It understands kind of the way lenses work. It understands the way light goes through like glass and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, it has a bunch of like the, like just knowledge about that, that uh, the, the ones that I look at aren't, Sound, I, I'm pretty sure they're just completely synthesized. They're just dry. I mean, one thing I've been trying to experiment with, and it's a, it's a hard instruction to do, but I think it's informative, is if you if you ask one of these programs to rotate something, you know, from like if you're dealing with a face, from full face to to profile, or you yeah. know, light light it in a different way it's, it's hard to get it to follow that those instructions yeah. but um it looks to me like it's not taking the same information and applying your new instructions to it it is oh i've got to do a profile so i've got a sample from images that are profiles not not the image that i gave you with the exact same instruct instructions yeah, you know, it, it, they don't have any memory right now of, of what they're building. I, and I wouldn't say sample a profile. What I would say is it, it tries to remember what a profile looks like and yeah. it keeps drawing, a, you know, different things until it says this looks like a, a profile that I remember. And it's remembering thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of profiles or silhouettes or whatever, right? I am so, so happy to hear you use the language it understands this knowledge and it remembers it remembers 
<laughs> because that's so wrong. It's so absolutely completely wrong. It is just not. It is not remembering. It is not understanding, and it's not knowing. It is just. <laughs> Oh gosh, it's so easy to fool ourselves. It's it's just beautiful to to hear that. I mean, I respect you completely, and I think you're a brilliant person, and uh, I love you to pieces. But you're so wrong, and <laughs> and I just don't you know have the the ability to 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 kind of go into that. Um, it's not using sign processes it's not using semiosis it's using a kind of, or it's not using the kind of understanding knowing and what was the other one um remembering that is what we call understanding knowing and remembering that eric does that pete does that michael does it's doing a mechanical process and understanding is not mechanical. Knowing is not mechanical. Remembering is not mechanical. It's biological. It's it's a biological process that um, yes, we can do something that's analogous to it, but to assign that kind of mythopoeic language, the same language that refer to a friend, a lover, a ourselves, doing understanding, knowing, and remembering, and, and give that to Dolly. I am just absolutely thrilled to hear you say that because it's just so absolutely frightening and loving at the same time. That fear and love at the same time that what's her name said couldn't exist. It's right fucking there. Right there. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you for listening. Um, I, I'd love to talk about that more too. Yeah, um, well, it's it's all a way of trying to find the time to be an artist rather than an engineer. I, I just need to shift my shift my uh, ability in in this world and in this life from fixing. 20 year old PHP and doing new um, JavaScript um, object design to just, you know, living a much, you know, so my computer died and I've got eight, you know, things of writing the uh, talk today, which I'll type in later when I can. Um, so we got Fox Pro off your computer just in time. No, 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 no. It's, okay. it's, it's the uh, the ThinkPad X1 Nano. Yeah. Um, the uh, the backlight died, and so okay, I could not get it to. You could plug in a monitor then anymore. Yeah. No, 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 no. That was the thing. Uh, it, it used to work on the monitor, but somehow it stopped working, and I could not, for the life of me, figure out how to get to reconnect to the monitor. So I drove to the Internet Archive. Mm. and connected it and thank god it connected to the monitor and i took the data off and now i'm going to use a different computer um to present at do you, have... <laughs> do, you do you realize how big the um repair of old computers is on the youtube that uh, people have videos showing them oh, yeah, yeah, no, soldering. No, no. it's just amazing yeah it's it's a it's a fuse that has yeah. a tiny little crack on it and i have yeah it, yeah it brings or, up the, the right to repair because like a guy was trying to open up a phone and it took a half hour with an eye fix i am <laughs> i am such the poor artist that i don't have enough to pay 81 dollars to lenovo to get the warranty um mm -hmm. so that they can come in and fix it tomorrow so that i can use it for dweb um and i'm leaving monday um so i just thank god i have an older computer that um, is broken in a different way. Um, it won't run on battery. It has to be plugged in. But, uh, you know, it's just, you find a problem, you root around it and, uh, you know, so, make, make something work. So one thing related to that, I'm backing up all my MX uh, daily zip files to the decentralized web. So I have a copy on my network if people want to share and peer, seed it, it's possible. I mean, just exploring the possibilities here. Um, I anyway. also mentioned that Pete, oh. the, the, um, the, your meme brain. Yeah, I, I'm, I have that in my mind as well. So like I'm shifting between MX, meme brain, just yeah. comparing them. 
I can't wrap my head around the Python code right now, but I could get this concept of how you get JSON out of brain. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, the um, Mark Antoine did a, a wonderful thing and he rewrote a lot of meme brain um, mm -hmm. in much, much more elegant Python. Right. Um, which I cannot now read very well either. I, I get it. Uh, yeah, it's hard to so follow. So yeah. if you, if you uh, hit the commit log, yeah. uh, the commit history, I could and go back. look back okay. at my last one, cool. it, Thank it you. will probably be, <laughs> I, I write him yeah. fairly simple. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought. we grew up procedurally. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, so Eric, like, um, yeah, thanks you for what you're doing. Um, sure. Thanks so much. I'm so happy beautiful that you're thing. using it your own way. It's so beautiful mm -hmm. to me. Cool. And uh, I have a hell of a lot of work to do um, for this 400 people in the yep. in the woods east of Mendocino. Sure. Um, so uh, it's fun not work. only me. Thank you so much. Isn't it fun yeah. work? Yeah. It's sort of. It's it's funner work than uh, basically yes. you know, looking at the code. And, and uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of letting down my colleagues on the UX team. But you know, I'm I'm a baby, I'm a baby something here at the Internet Archive. Yeah. Rather than well, senior, I found when I took a two week funky. vacation, people did they did fine. Yeah, they did fine. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I was out for cancer for a year, they did fine. So you know, um, it's just uh, a, a friggin' risk to just start acting as an artist and see if they'll continue to pay me. We'll see. Yeah, you squeeze it in like Albert Einstein did. Um, let's chat Something more, like folks. That. Okay, guys. Uh, yeah. Love these threads. Take care. Thanks. Okay, Mike. Bye, yeah, y'all stay with you, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Gil. Gil is uh, stuck guess, with us. I guess we're still we're still with Gil. <laughs> sure, that's fine. Jerry can edit this out if needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I thank you for your note on Mattermost, and and uh, you know, I and and thank you for everything you've been you've been doing, you know, with regard to, you know, Stacy and, and um, I, and I, I'm, I'm sort of feeling my way a little bit it, that that proposal happened to hit me at a moment where I was so overwhelmed anyway, oh, yeah. okay. that I, I said to Stacy, I can't really, I don't really have the bandwidth for this right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, um, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. Yeah. And and I'm also curious to to you know to talk to you about um, you know just some of this uh, um, differently formatted brain overlap and and um, and ways to mm -hmm. consensually share the stuff that we all amass. Yeah, um, and it's you know it's a, just a, a summary. It comes down to managing keys rather than permissions in a server. So like I could create as many keys as I want. If I share one with you, it's what I want to share with you. Right. Share one with Mark. It's what I trust him to see. Right, and share one publicly, maybe without attribution. Yeah, I could have a public. Want, but... Like if if you yeah. if you want, I mean, a kind of circling back to the to the music and art sampling thing yeah. it's like if you want to put out your stuff into the world to be part of other people's samples i mean yeah it, like songs i wrote I, 20 years ago they're public domain and uh, right. they're available for people yeah 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 um, okay cool anyway. yeah just uh contact me on mattermost we'll set up some time likewise okay all right all right thanks everybody i'm yeah. gonna leave uh, i don't know if gil's gonna keep this song forever <laughs> <laughs> all right bye I, oh, you, you have control. You could end the meeting, actually. You yeah, do, I'll end. Yeah, do an end meeting for. And all. and I'm I'm just assuming that wherever um, uh, Jerry had the the recording being saved to, it's going to go. Um, yeah, it I'll, should. Uh, it, it shows should up on my hard drive. All, oh yeah, you could email him. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Try that end meeting for all. Just want to make sure it works. Yeah.